All right, perfect. Let's get going. Well, thank you all for joining. For those that are attending, um, my name is Zach. I am a sales enterprise lead here for Cluedings UK team. In other words, I would be your point of contact in case you are intrigued and you want to know more about Cluedings and OpenAI moving forward. And I will be hosting today's session. Now, today I am joined by Cluedings CEO and master data expert Tim Ward and Paolo Colecchia, Microsoft Advanced Analytics and AI architect and all-around Azure OpenAI expert. Good morning, gentlemen, and thank you both for joining today's session. Morning, morning, Jack. Uh, morning everyone. <laughs> so over the next hour, we will be showing you how to govern data in business with AI. Now, of course, this is probably a topic you've heard before, um, and there is no shortage, obviously, of sessions that talk about the potential and capabilities of AI. Now, the difference between those sessions and ours is that we are not gonna focus on theoretical scenarios or use cases, we are instead going to, with the help of Tim and Paolo, walk you through the exact steps needed to follow, that you need to follow to start leveraging AI in your business data governance today with Cluedit. Now, this is also an interactive session, so if you have any questions for our experts, please feel free to submit them throughout the presentation. You just need to click the question icon mark, so that's the question icon mark, guys. Type it out, and we will dedicate the last 15 to 20 minutes depending on timing of the hour to answer them for you. Now, with that, I won't keep you any longer. Kicking off the talks with our fantastic CEO. Take it away, Tim. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Paolo. I'll uh, talk to you a little bit later. So let's share my screen and get started. So as uh, Zach alluded to, you know, really today is about the kind of practical and tangible use cases of Azure OpenAI. And this is not a webinar uh, specifically about um, what is OpenAI? What is large language models? I think most of you are coming here because you're way past that point. Um, this is a, how do we actually run this in a production environment? Uh, how do we get operational use cases up and running where we can use this and gain value from it? We're fortunate enough at Clued In uh, and uh, Paolo's joining us here from the Microsoft team as well, that we've been working with our customers uh, in production environments with Azure OpenAI for roughly the last two months, right? Um, and uh, what this has led to is um, some pretty um, big learnings, um, some pretty kind of on the job learnings, I guess you could say as well, because this is such an evolving space, but such an exciting space at the same time as well. So today we're really gonna talk about the practical and tangible ways that you can run, operationalize, and scale the use of large language models, in this case, Azure OpenAI, for data management and data governance use cases. Let's dive in. So I guess the first thing, let's zoom out for a second, and let's just think about what's missing in data management today. There's so many different tools we can all use. There's so many different uh, approaches we can take that are all leaning on this kind of core concept of how do I make data ready for insight? I know that data can fuel initiatives. I know that it's already today doing it and it will do it in the future, but how can we actually practically uh, apply this in live operational cases with all the kind of guardrails around it, around it to make it come to actual fruition. So for us at Clued In, we've had some really interesting learnings. Um, we've been spending this last two months pretty dedicated hands-on with our customers and we've learnt, I guess if we were to zoom out three things. Um, the number one thing is what these large language models have brought to the data management situation is first of all, to give us a pretty good answer and that's economically and also just viable from a implementation perspective. What do we do about all these cases in data management that are hard to codify? Maybe hard, but also close to impossible or impractical to codify. And I mean, good examples would be these very fuzzy things that we need to solve in data management that don't necessarily adhere to any patterns or don't uh, adhere to any logic that we can put together. Good examples would be detecting things like personal data. Um, I think everyone on this webinar would agree that it's rather easy to detect things like, I don't know, credit card numbers, IBAN numbers. These are issues around PCI DSS compliance. Um, but then there's always nuance in these uh, pattern detection techniques. What if there's a missing 
number off the end of that credit card? What if we've uh, got a job title? Or what if we've got something that's very fuzzy in its ability and doesn't adhere to any pattern? So for the data management cases specifically, these are the kind of things we're going to focus on is what falls outside the spectrum of what can be solved already in pretty proven techniques today. The other thing that it brings, and uh, it's, uh, I guess um, when I say this, um, we are also uh, clued in, and I'm sure at Microsoft uh, very much uh, in this boat, is that there's all these challenges involved with data management where as soon as it falls into the unstructured zone, things like PDF documents and Word documents, PowerPoint, email documents, things like this, um, some of these things are always hard to actually guarantee. And because in many cases, uh, we're dealing with a certain level of heuristics. We're, de we're dealing with a certain level of risk that we're willing to accept in to detect things like personal data within um, unstructured data, references to individuals with unstructured data, sentiment analysis within unstructured data. These are all things that there's no proven deterministic approach to solving these challenges. And these are some of the things that open AI, large language models really help us fill the gap with. And so at the end of the day, um, what does this lead to? Well, if we go back to the whole concept of what we're trying to do here uh, at Clued In, it's about how, how can we involve non-technical people in the supply chain of data? And when I mean supply chain, I mean, obviously there's data coming from all of these different sources. And then there's some targets that we wanna push it to where we can actually you know, yield some type of value, whether that's generating insights in Power BI, whether that's doing something with machine learning or artificial intelligence. But the core comes of, you know, how does the business non-technical people play a role in that supply chain? And, you know, how do we give these individuals a way of doing that that's not coding based, that's not scripting based, but allows them to bring their value to that supply, ch supply chain, which is usually around the idea of they have the context behind the data. They understand the business value of the data. That's where the real value is uh, buried. Now, this is easier said than done, right? It's easy for me to sit here and say, you know, we need to clean data. We need to standardize data. We need compliance and regulation around our data. Um, and if we look into the uh, large language models with Azure OpenAI, that even becomes a little bit even more easier said than done. Those of you who have spent time with these large language models will know that this is not a database full of facts. This is a reasoning engine that we're dealing with here, an evolving one at that. And uh, just like us as humans, we can get things wrong, right? So how do we deal with those situations when we're wanting to operationalize the use of these large language models into production use cases. And let's all be honest, this is probably the fastest evolving space we've all been privy to and witnessed to in the last uh, five, 10 years. This is a moving beast. So something that Paolo and I and Zach say to you today might actually change within two or three weeks. So how do we kind of put some guardrails and process and explainability around this to actually make sure we can use this in real life production operational use cases. So how do we tie this back to clued in? Well, the large language models are obviously exciting, but what, why and what do they have to do with data governance and master data management? Well, for this, I wanna tell you a little bit of a story. About 30 years ago, the concept of master data management started to come to uh, fruition. And it had this simple promise. It was, how do we bridge IT and business? Because what it identified is that it's key for non-technical business users that are close to the actual context of the data to play a role in this supply chain. But if we fast forward roughly to today, things haven't gone so well. This is in roughly 2022, early 2022, 
a statistic from an analyst firm called Gartner that says that roughly 79% of these MDM initiatives will fail. And uh, you can imagine if this is the pillar that's playing a role in that data supply chain that's bringing in the business users, if we can't crack this, this is a big issue. Why is this? Why, what has led to the 79% failure rate of bringing the business and involving in them this inherently technical, implemented and operated set of stacks that we're setting up for our own companies or maybe even for our customers? Well, let's dive in and take a look because we need to understand what type of value that these large language models can bring to this space. After all, this is about bringing the business, the non-technical people into the supply chain. If we take a look at the anatomy of a typical implementation of MDM, and for anyone on the call that's joining that has implemented data warehousing, or even data integration projects, there's roughly no difference between those and what I'm going to talk about right now. Here's what made traditionally MDM really hard to implement. In most cases, MDM was about shoveling, unraveling this technical debt that we had built up in our data over 20, 30 years of trying to implement new data warehouses, trying to implement new data integration solutions. And MDM comes along and says, no, we're, we're, we're not going to deal with that uh, 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 technical data debt anymore. It's our time to actually address that. We need data to be clean, standardized, governed, auditable, so we can deliver that to the business. But if history talks, this is what it told us, is that Starting off, when we go off and uh, initiate these MDM projects, the first thing that we need to do is we need to model our data up front. Why is that key? Because there's another way of saying this, is that you have to tell me as a database engineer, as an MDM engineer, as an IT or an engineer, that you need to tell me what your data looks like today and what it will look like for the next uh, few years. Because it's gonna be hard to change this and evolve this model just based off the approach of MDM traditionally and the technologies these were based off. Now you and I probably already are uh, aware, and this is something that's become ever present with the new era of data warehouses, is that the concept of modeling your data upfront does not work. It will not survive the natural entropy of a business. Secondly, what made it complex was the actual technology itself, but also the actual problem that we needed to solve. It became so complex that often these solutions were handed back to IT to not only implement, but to operate as well. And there was this friction that came from that, where the individuals implementing this they already had a suite of tools that were targeted towards them for them to play a role on the supply chain. They're engineers, they know SQL, they know Python, they know scripting. They have tools that are specifically built for them in that supply chain. But MDM was supposed to come in and say, this is about involving the non-technical people. And all of this resulted in one major thing. These projects took a long time to get out and they took a long time to prove any value. Why is this the case? Because more often than not, they were built in a very waterfall approach where we couldn't solve things later on in the chain until we had solved the earlier parts, i.e. we couldn't actually get data into the systems until they fit perfectly into this predefined model. We couldn't start to clean the data until we had actually standardized it. We couldn't start to look at deduplication of records until it was clean. And we couldn't actually get this data out to the business before all of those processes were implemented. So it's of no surprise 
that this traditional approach led to these pretty big bang um, projects where, you know, 24 months into the project, there's nothing to actually share out with the business in regard to value. So this is one of the reasons why Cluden exists. Um, Cluden is really based off taking those complex parts about implementing MDM and not making them simpler. It's about completely eliminating them. And this has resulted in a couple of key quantum leaps in the modern MDM space. Starting with the idea of zero modeling in that we don't need to model our data upfront to get it into our, the MDM system to actually start working and helping you and augmenting the experience of making that data ready for insight. And this is something very much where Azure OpenAI has played a key role in being one of the many natural interfaces for a non-technical user to play a role in that supply chain. What does this result in? This results in a solution that can help you augment your existing stack, clean, standardize the data and get data out that's ready for insight, right? ready for business intelligence, ready for custom machine learning that you might be running, ready for pushing back into operational systems as well. So let's dive into the Azure OpenAI pieces. So Cluedin is the first uh, master data management system to market that integrates with the Azure OpenAI um, uh, layer. And in this, um, Cluedin is native to Microsoft Azure customers. We integrate with over 26 of the different services that are available within that stack. Anything from Azure Data Factory to Purview to Service Bus to Event Hub, you name it. There's a good integration and native way to be able to have those systems talk. But I think the biggest values overall that the Azure OpenAI piece has brought to the MDM world is that it offers non-technical users a natural way, a language to be able to naturally talk to their data if that's to transform data, to clean it, maybe it's to set policies in place, um, and to really act as this overall co-pilot to solve what is inherently quite a complex challenge, which is about really undoing all that technical debt that we've uh, accrued across the different data silos of our business. So let's dive in and take a look at some of these things. Um, so I'm wanting to, introduce a couple of use cases here. So I'm going to dive into the Cluedin platform in a second. It's integrated and hooked up already to the Azure OpenAI um, REST API. And uh, we're dealing with some pretty sensitive data in this use case. We're dealing with uh, health data, so patient data. Very sensitive. Um, uh, we've got data quality issues. Um, and essentially we need to make this data ready for insight. So let's talk through the use cases that we're going to show off here. The first thing that we need to think about when we're starting to integrate Azure and OpenAI into our processes is um, what is the actual process? So when we go off and ask Azure OpenAI to help us out with enrichment or maybe to do some transformation or standardization, how can we actually put this behind some type of workflow that involves humans in that loop? Because this is not just about you talking with chat GPT or talking with the different playgrounds that uh, Microsoft give you. We're now pushing this into an actual operational flow. How do we set up the processes in that place to, I guess, involve us when necessary? Now, it's easy for me to say, and there's a 100% solution for this, which is everything that comes from Azure OpenAI, we can put behind a workflow. That's a very predictable state that we can set up for ourselves. But it doesn't come very practical when we need to work with maybe millions of changes per day, and this is where the scale piece comes in. How do we actually scale this? That if we have millions of changes that we need to review, on a daily basis. How are we actually going to deal with this as a business? So let's um, dive into the second example we're going to show off. We're going to show off to um, make this uh, work in a production environment. How do we actually explain 
the reasoning behind what we're asking Azure OpenAI to help us out with as well. So this is about that trust. It's about that audit trail that if we've got an engine helping us out with maybe enriching records or maybe it's standardization of data, how do we actually back up that that uh, large language model has made a reasonable decision on its answer that it's handing back to us? Now, we're later on in the session, we will uh, deal with this in a different way. But how do we set up kind of reference checks um, for the reasoning as well? So let's think about this as humans. If you are in a conversation with a colleague and you're asking a question, um, one of the first things you're probably going to ask once you get a response from them is, well, what's backing up your answer? Can you give me some type of references to back up your reasoning of why you're telling me a specific answer? And for those of you who have spent time with these large language models, you'll realize that um, they have the ability to make up things. And these are one of the challenges that we'll see in our demonstration, but we'll fix later on with um, uh, some other components in Azure OpenAI as well. We'll then talk about how we can roll back changes easily when we found something that's incorrect, where we've uh, realized that the Azure OpenAI model uh, might be uh, leading us in the wrong direction of an answer. How do we actually undo and keep this in a safe, predictable uh, and reliable environment? And then finally, this is the last piece that we'll touch on today. Now, I'm very much aware that um, this uh, is in a public preview, and many of you might not already have access to this in the Azure OpenAI playgrounds, but this is just a more to kind of give you a forecast of what's coming in the roadmap for Azure OpenAI and how that can help us um, add reliability and robustness about putting these into production use cases. Excellent. So with that in mind, let's dive into the platform and let's get going. So let me set up the scenario for you here. Here is a brand new clued in environment. Um, and I've imported uh, some data into the platform and we can go and take a look at that. It's over here. So if I go to search the data, it's going to come up with a list of patient records. So this is to do with health. We're dealing with individuals here. This is highly sensitive data. And we can see we've got properties like address data, age, birth date, very personal data. In some cases, maybe PII data. In some cases, PHI data. We've got phone numbers in different standards. We've got email addresses. This is you know, getting very personal. And um, this is a common use case for master data management, you know, whether it's dealing with employees, whether it's dealing with patients, doctors, hospitals, it could be dealing with customers, vendors, suppliers. These are the types of data that you would usually put into an MDM system. So what I've got here is I'm going to head over to one of these records. Let's take uh, Rog here. And we can see a couple of things. This is what's called his single view record. This is everything we know about ROG in one single place. So for example, I ingested his record about four hours ago. We can head into his properties and we can see a list of his data. This is ages, birth dates, etc. We can see if there's any related records to ROG in this. And finally, we can see an audit trail of ROG. So where the data actually came from, it looks like it came from a file called patients.csv and that I've manually um, edited and added data to this record in Cludin as well. So Cludin is this place to get the single source of truth no matter where we get the data from. What's interesting for this demonstration is if we head over to our management section and click on the rule builder. This is where all the Azure OpenAI piece comes in. You can envisage Include in as a place to input data and then export data to different targets where the idea is that the targets is where we spit out the clean, governed, uh, transformed, standardized, normalized data um, that's also gone through the Azure uh, OpenAI um, uh, large language model as well. 
So I've set up about five different rules here on the data. Let's go in and see how we can bridge these two systems to automate the use of Azure OpenAI in our processes. So I'm gonna click on this uh, rule. This is an interesting one. It's called check if work, and that's a spelling mistake, so let me choose that, uh, fix that, or private email address. So as you can probably gauge, this is going to check based off the patient if the email that they've given us is a work <laughs> email address or a private email address. Now think about this. If you're an engineer on the call, how would you crack this? And actually, I would ask in the chat, feel free to put in how you would approach solving this problem. Because there's a couple of ways to solve this. Um, one of them would obviously to be able to hand it to an engineering team and say, listen, here is a list of email providers like Gmail and Hotmail. And if anyone has a, uh, a, a, an email address that ends in that domain, you can start to flag it as more of a private email address than a work address. Now then, if you think about it, that means that you have to maintain that list over time, um, that you actually have to write the code and the logic to determine that. And that's what we had available to us before these large language models. Let's take a look at how a non-technical person can solve this, including today. Um, so let's start off with dissecting what we're seeing here. Here we have a business rule included. And as you can see on the screen, pretty self-explanatory. It's saying for a filter, we're going to take any type of data that equals to a patient. That's the only data that this rule is actually going to be applied to. And then it's going to run these different actions. One is called check, one is called get match confidence, and one is called get match confidence with nuanced match confidence prompt. What a mouthful. Let's go and edit the first one here. And this becomes super interesting because what we're doing here is we're asking for Cludin to talk to the Azure OpenAI. And this is the particular prompt that we're asking it. We're saying, is the email of, insert context email, a work or a private email address? That's a very natural way of asking the solution for this particular problem. In this case, we're using a model in Azure OpenAI called DaVinci, and we're asking it to save the result in a field called work or personal. So what is this going to do? Well, once we enable this, this is going to go off. It's going to inject the email of the current record we're looking at, and it's going to ask the OpenAI to give it an answer. Now that's all great. But this is, a, uh, this is a webinar about how do we actually productionize this? Because uh, many, many of you who have worked with this will realize it can get these things wrong. Okay, so let's go and look at the next rule action we've got set up here. And in this case, we're once again asking the, AP, the AI and we're asking it the same question, but look at the prompt that we're putting on the end of it. We're saying, just return how confident you are with the answer in the form of a percentage from zero to 100. Just return the number itself. Notice how naturally we're just prompting the engine to do something in English. We're not coding anything. And we're gonna save that in a field called match confidence. Finally, and this is to highlight one of the things we've learned running this in production with our customers, is that depending on the prompt you're actually wanting to write, the same uh, generic query or prompt to go off and get the confidence level does not work across all the different prompts. Sometimes based off the actual thing you're wanting to solve, you might need to add some nuance to get these types of confidence levels. Why are we getting these confidence levels? We're getting them because we want to be able to short circuit any record that has a low confidence in its reasoning and involve a human in the loop. That's what we're wanting to do here. So let's finally look at this last prompt. So once again, we're asking the same question, but now we're saying, just return how confident you are with your answer in the form of percentage. That's similar to what we had before. 
And then look at what we're doing. We're helping the engine. We're saying to help with returning the score, a good sign. Let me just do that again because I moved that around. So a good sign that an email is related to a work email address is if the domain is not a common email provider such as Gmail or Hotmail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this down because what I've set up here is a rule that not only will go off and do my work, but it will provide me with different levels of confidence that I can use to short circuit that into a workflow process. Let's go ahead and activate this rule. I'm going to head back and let's just take a random record here. Let's take a Psy. Let's go to their view and we can see that they've got some data here. They've got their last name, first name, gender, birth date. And I'm going to go off and I'm going to reprocess this record. So I'm going to tell this record, can you run through all the active rules that have been enabled? And once that's done, it should be pretty quick. We're going to refresh the page. And we should see some extra fields added here. And we have, right? So um, for me, it's now saying this appears to be a private email address and I have 0% confidence in my answer. This is a good example of something where we would start to involve a human in that process. Let's go find another person and trigger it against theirs. Let's take, um, we'll take one of the first ones here, Tiffany. What a way to spell Tiffany. Um, we're going to reprocess this entity, head over to the properties, refresh the page, shouldn't take too long. So it looks like we've got a uh, IHG.com, which I know is a company. And you can see that it's bringing back a couple of things. First of all, it's tagging this as a work email address. And now the match confidence is actually coming back for not only the naive prompt that I added, but also the nuance prompt that I added that says, I'm 100% confident this is a work email address. So how do you start to involve this in a process? So obviously, these records are changing within the platform. What I can do is include in, I've set a couple of um, workflows. In this particular case, let's look at some of the workflows that I've set up. I've set up a workflow that says, where any record is equal to a patient and their match confidence equals 100, the workflow is, don't worry, you can go out, you can go out to wherever you need to go. But anything that doesn't match that will go through a workflow process and include in, we use Power Automate as our native workflow engine to do that. Let's look at a couple of other examples. So I'm going to disable that private work and email and let's go and take a look at this one. So in this one, we are saying, is this PHI data? Now, this is one of those statements where it's, wow, that's easier said than done to actually solve. But here we're running this against patients and let's go a look at what we're asking OpenAI to help us out with. In this case, we're saying, hey, Given what value I have in the gender field, is this considered PHI? And just return a yes or a no. Okay, so personal health identifiers. Just so you know, uh, in PHI world, this is not considered um, PHI. Um, so I'm hoping in our examples, of course, that it's going to bring back no as the example. Here, we're asking something different. We're not asking for a match confidence. In this case, we're actually going to ask for it just to explain itself. Is this value we're injecting considered PHI data and return the result in a field called is PHI explanation? So let's go ahead and turn this guy on. I'm going to enable that. Let's head back to our data. I'm going to randomly choose any of these records. Let's take Madeline. If we head to her properties, we're going to see that we have the core metadata here, 
But as soon as we actually re <coughs> reprocess this record, this is what's going to go off and ask that Azure OpenAI service to answer those questions and bring back those results. So if I refresh my record here pretty quickly, I'm going to see a couple of things. Number one, I'm going to see that this uh, female value is not uh, classed or classified as PHI data. And I've also uh, got an explanation here. Now, this is a great example, and uh, this is something I tested before. Notice what's happening here. No, yes, no, yes. What does this prove? This proves that you need to iterate on these prompts that you build in that it can clearly contradict itself. And the way to get yourself out of the situation is to add more nuance to your prompts that help it through these different situations. And for me, that's the one thing that we've seen so exciting about using this with our customers is that they can iterate in an agile way where it won't get things right all the time. But whenever we do pick up on these values where it gets things wrong, it's about adding extra things to our prompts to be able to cater for these situations. We don't have to go back and code. We don't have to go back and uh, change anything in our logic. It's about iterating on those, uh, those prompts that we put together. I think the final two things that we're going to touch on is um, this, this kind of topic of, won't this cost me so much money, right? in that to productionize this, if I'm asking Azure OpenAI or any large language model for every record to do this and that and PHI detection and standardization, isn't this going to cost me a whole bunch of money? Here's a good example of how you crack this. It really comes down to lowering the overall surface area of how often you're asking Azure OpenAI to help you. I'll give you a good example with things like um, detecting things. So in this case, we're looking at all the patients and we've got this rule action that says, do not ask OpenAI if we can codify it. And here I have one of the out of the box rules from Clued in, and all it's doing is it's saying, if the age is a number using very predictable and deterministic approaches, in this case, it's evaluating a regular expression, then use the regular expression. But if we return a false result, that's where we would actually go off and ask Azure OpenAI, and we would say, is this a number? So in this case, we're doing these pre-processing checks to say, for all the things that adhere to a pattern, don't worry about asking Azure OpenAI, but I've got this nice fallback that if it falls through that logic and deterministic approach, that I can go off and spend my tokens to Azure OpenAI for it to help. The final thing before I hand over to Paolo is we're going to touch on the uh, plugins. So um, let's go through an example where we're taking our patient data. And in this time, we're going to ask the Azure OpenAI, given the insurance provider for the patient, how confident are you that that insurance provider is an insurance provider? Return the answer in a score from zero to 100, where a score of 100 means that you have 10 online links that back up your answer. This is super interesting because this is very much what you as a human would ask a colleague or a friend of, you know, um, what's the cure to this problem? And if they give you an answer, uh, it would be the right thing to say, give me the links and the references of what got you to that answer. And this is what we're asking in this prompt. However, if you were starting to work with the Azure OpenAI two months ago, you would realize it would give you really confident answers back and it would produce these links. The challenge is that in many cases, these links would not exist. It would hallucinate them. There's, it would just make these links up. But that is something that the Azure plugins via the web, the Bing, 
uh, plugins have helped solve. It does real-time lookups to the web to be able to find real references, whether it's LinkedIn or Crunchbase or whatever, and providing those. So notice how we can augment our prompts now to also look for these references that could play a role in also our explanation. In this case, it's our match confidence. So these are some of the guardrails that we put in place to help our customers get into production. So I'm just gonna dive through three more slides and then Paolo, I'm gonna hand back to you, mate. So what are the things that we've learned? What should you be thinking about? Well, first of all, hopefully we've covered off a couple of the ways that you can solve with involving a workflow process into this. And also the whole idea behind asking the engine to give you a match confidence is to help you scale towards processing huge amounts of data. Obviously there is a, um, a very proven and deterministic way to uh, just say anything that comes from Azure OpenAI, we will check as a human, but this won't necessarily scale if we've got millions and millions of queries that we're getting in a day. So just be aware that, you know, obviously, as you can say, uh, you can see in my examples that Azure OpenAI and these large language models, they get things wrong. And the way to be able to solve this is to really iterate on your prompts. It's to test it against large bodies of data, find the problems um, where it's not, uh, where it's contradicting and add those uh, particular branches to be handled in your prompts. So here's some extra advice. One thing is that with the large language models, especially with Azure OpenAI, you can tune what's called the temperature. The temperature determines how creative the answers are going to be. Now, in the case of data governance and data management, the truth is that we want these to be not very creative. We want them to be predictable and repeatable. So I would really urge towards using a temperature of zero as low as possible to be able to, to do this. And finally, the other thing we've learned from running this into production with our customers is to always do the total cost of ownership um, in that there are many cases where solving some of these problems in a codified way um, with deterministic logic uh, can often um, uh, allu uh, alleviate the ability to call open AI for absolutely everything. But the irony here is uh, for the audience that um, what we found in most of the cases is that the TCO for just calling off and expending your tokens on the Azure open AI model far outweigh you trying to solve this in these codified and uh, deterministic ways. Um, as well. So that'll be, it'll be super interesting how that evolves within the industry. So this is clued in. We're a recommended master data management platform. We're also uh, highly rated from the analyst firms in the MDM space. And I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Tim. So what I'd like to do now is to share with you some of the use cases that we see in the AI fields and backed up also by Azure OpenAI, and also share with some of the new features that we uh, have announced, especially recently a build, and see how we can leverage in these new features to build some very complex, interesting, and powerful uh, pipelines uh, powered by Azure OpenAI. Having said that, let's now have a look a little bit at the uh, some of the use cases uh, powered by Azure OpenAI and the wider Azure AI ecosystem. So nowadays we are a lot about artificial intelligence. We are a lot about generative models and what they can possibly do. And uh, this era of AI, uh, the impact in this area of AI is real. And as you can see from my slides, I'm reporting some of our uh, customers along with their use cases. And you can see some very tangible ROI or business outcomes here. For instance, if we start with CarMax, which is one of our uh, customer based in the States, they originally started uh, as a startup and their main business model was basically to sell used cars, but they want to do it in a different way. And uh, before the era of generative models, obviously uh, CarMax was focusing a lot on uh, 
uh, going through the customer feedback, understand where what customers uh, wanted, if they were uh, providing some constructive feedback, how they could basically implement that in, embed that in, in their business models or uh, uh, operations, how to generate also better descriptions for cars so they have their marketing and editorial team as well. And to do all of this, obviously, manually took a lot of time. And with the uh, uh, generative model and the Azure OpenAI model, the DaVinci model, they now embed these capabilities, generative AI capabilities, as part of their business processes. And as you can see here from the slides, CarMax is estimating that it would have taken them 11 years to do, manually do, what Azure OpenAI can do in days. And this is because obviously Azure OpenAI is able to process very, very quickly customer feedback, understand what the customers uh, want, what's the customer sentiment, and how to take then actions uh, in order to generate perhaps a better description for cars so that everything uh, ties up nicely together and customers can get an amazing customer experience basically. Progressive as well, which is one of our insurance customers based in the States as well. It's saving around uh, 10 million with AI powered uh, chatbots. Here, chatbot is augmenting call center operations to make sure that we can understand straight away what the customer is talking about. And when there is that warm and over from the intelligent bot to the agent, the agent already knows everything. What, what was the point of the conversation till then and what needs to be done next so that there is a seamless customer experience. EY as well is saving around 250,000 hours of manual work per client using intelligent process automation. Intelligent process automation is one of the very common use cases across the industry and very, very powerful, which Azure OpenAI brought it to another level. There has been a sort of a quantum leap uh, with Azure OpenAI on how to do uh, intelligent process automation and how to quickly retrieve uh, insight and information across your vast knowledge base with unstructured, semi-structured, structured data. Having said that, though, let's now have a look a little bit at some of the latest capabilities that uh, we have announced with the Azure OpenAI uh, service. So as you can see in Azure OpenAI, uh, I already know about this, you know, the GPT-3 model, the Codex model, DALI, Chat GPT, these are all the foundation models. And now we have introduced capabilities that will enable you to grant your uh, Azure OpenAI service on your data. So you can apply that directly into your data. And as per a couple of days ago, now for any of you that has access to the Azure OpenAI instance, uh, and if you click on the chat GPT completion, you will see that there is basically a button there where you can click and uh, enables to, you to upload your data or point that service to a blob storage, a data lake. Or, uh, and uh, once that you do that, on, uh, you can start to do Q&A and do information retrieval and ask questions on your document straight away. Obviously, that is available from an AI, uh, UI perspective, also from a programmatic way as well. Then we have announced uh, also plugins for Azure OpenAI service and team touched base upon it. We uh, also uh, announced that we uh, gonna enable our customer to configure content filters as well. And we also announced a content filter moderation uh, too as a service. And this is a, one of the really powerful um, uh, responsible AI uh, capabilities that we announced recently, because now you can also, when you build uh, uh, an intelligent application or you embed uh, uh, a generative model like Azure OpenAI as part of your process, you can also test if your prompts are uh, ethical and uh, are not harmful type of prompts as well. Then we also announced the provision throughput, which uh, enables our customer basically to buy the capacity and uh, make sure that they will have you know, a uh, guaranteed throughput as part of their uh, use of Azure OpenAI service and interaction with the service. Now, also a build, we have announced loads of co-pilots. But one that is really interesting, especially for uh, the developer community as well, and for our customers who want to build intelligent application and build their own copilot, the custom copilot, we introduced the Azure Copilot stack that basically leverages on the Azure OpenAI capabilities together with plugins 
and together with another uh, capability that we have released, which is prompt flow, uh, which enables you, as we will see shortly, to orchestrate some very complex prompt engineering so that uh, you can do, um, uh, given a certain prompt, you can do what is called retrieve, augment, and generate patterns. You can integrate with different type of uh, systems and application so that you can give the Azure OpenAI system um, uh, all the context that is needed in order to give you uh, the right answer back. And uh, uh, there are a set of uh, platform plugins that we uh, we have announced. Uh, there is obviously the one for cognitive search, which is our search capability at scale, which is the one for uh, Translate, uh, our translator service to translate for more than 100 languages. A Bing plugin, obviously, to integrate with Bing uh, as well, and the SQL one to structure uh, to extract structured data uh, too. And once that uh, you have basically all these plugins and the capability to build your own prompt engineering with the, our Azure Machine Learning prompt flow, now we enable our customers to uh, build a uh, prompt from scratch. Uh, we provide our customer with all the capabilities that they, are, they need to integrate basically to ground their model, uh, ground their data, to either an Azure OpenAI service, for instance, or if needs be, also to an open uh, open source large language model as well. You can build your own uh, integration with all the necessary application and backend systems so that you can uh, retrieve all the relevant data to make sure that your Azure OpenAI model uh, service, sorry, can make the right, uh, can generate the right uh, answer. And in addition to this, another very important capability that is part of the uh, prompt flow is that you can now test also, once that you created basic your um, prompt engineer uh, process, you can also test it. You can batch test it against a series of prompts and see basically the uh, how the uh, your flow is performing. And you can also leverage on our pre-built machine learning models that uh, enable you to score basically the output of your prompts with what instead should have been and gives you basically a stats of how is basically your prompts performing. And it's really, really powerful. And you can monitor it as well, and you can deploy it as a destination point so that you can embed it within your uh, application uh, workflow uh, as well. Recently, we also announced that uh, uh, our uh, Azure OpenAI service can obviously be grounded on your data, as I mentioned before, but we also announced that our search capabilities, cognitive search capabilities, also supports uh, 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 vector data. So, uh, once that you upload the data, uh, let's say uh, structured data, text, PDF, words, whatever that uh, uh, file format it is, you now have the possibility to not only index that data, but also to create a vector uh, representation of your data and store it in Azure Search. And when you run the search powered by Azure OpenAI, uh, we will be able to implement some very complex search capabilities that will enable us to retrieve the right uh, the right data and have also a link to the citation of the document basically containing the answer to your question as well. Lastly, uh, another thing that I'd like to mention is that uh, the uh, Azure OpenAI service content filtering which is now uh, available as a service, as I said before, so that you can embed uh, your responsible AI and uh, protection uh, from uh, harmful content or unethical content within your application. And this service is able basically to control the prompts that your application, your end user sends to your application or system uh, and check it to make sure that it's not harmful or unethical, even before that you are actually able to send the request to the Azure OpenAI service to perform, to execute that particular prompt. So you can, uh, uh, we provide our customer with an extra level of uh, uh, security uh, that is needed uh, so that we can make sure that our application, that we built intelligent application are critical. 
here is just a, uh, as you can see in my uh, PowerPoint, there is a video that basically shows uh, how you can, as an end user, uh, for, for, uh, decide for each prompt uh, uh, what is basically uh, the standards that you want to set. Uh, if it's, for instance, a law, uh, uh, law for eight or uh, self harm and so on and so forth, you can, you can decide what is uh, what is the right level of security that you need and then basically you can deploy this uh, uh, setting as an endpoint and embed it within your application that was it from my side thank you very much for your time and uh, i will land it over uh, back uh, to the host now thank you very much paolo Thank you, Tim. I know we kind of really got it very close to the to the uh, to the hour. So, um, guys, if you have any questions, please hit the question mark and submit them. Tim and Paolo, can we run over by two minutes just to answer maybe two sure. questions? And you okay? Perfect. And for the attendees, for the for, for those that can hang around a little longer, then you will have uh, an answer directly. Otherwise, we will come back to you with few answers either directly or through the recording, which you can see later. So again, if you have any questions, please hit the question mark and submit them. I will ask our panelists once I get them. Um, mm -hmm. This one is for you, Tim. It is uh -huh. in your experience. Here's a question. In your experience, how many iterations does an Azure OpenAI prompt, including, tend to go through before users tend to, to be satisfied with the outcome? Uh, uh, the answer is endless. <laughs> so <laughs> you will always expect, you should always expect iterations. There will always be a, a way to make it more precise. Uh, and you'll always have these edge cases. So. It's often good to, when you're putting these prompts, I think one of the reasons why they call it a prompt engineer is to, it, it does help to think like an engineer. So in software engineering, we think in kind of logic branches, if this, then that, else this. And uh, we found that if you build our prompts like that, uh, it really allows you to get in the situation where you throw a million records at it and 16 of them don't hit, and then you fix those 16. <laughs> Then you throw yeah. another million at it and 34 this time and you look at the 34 and you iterate and you iterate so you'll never get it right because we're not dealing with deterministic situations here we're dealing with heuristic situations brilliant anything to add to that paolo or can i go to the next question uh, i totally echo what tim said in the end uh, it's a matter of uh, going through some iteration process because we are dealing with generative models and yeah. the more let's say context we give and the better yeah. let's say they are able to perform and if we do also parallelism with humans as well right when we need yeah. to perform a task the more context we get and the better we are at it less context we get and and uh, obviously less performance we are mm -hmm. brilliant thank you gentlemen uh Second question. This is this one is for you, Paolo. Does OpenAI learn from my organization data? I probably just answered the question, but just to, if you have anything to add, maybe. Right, right. So the uh, great question, and uh, uh, the Azure OpenAI service um, uh, does not uh, retrain the state itself with customer data. It's a capabilities that as an organization we offer, but it's only triggered by the customer. Everything is under the customer control. If by any reason the customer will need to retrain a given uh, Azure OpenAI uh, model, uh, then it, the customer can do it. It's completely under its own control. All the data are under uh, the customer control, can retrain the model, will get a new endpoint, and then can delete this data. But Microsoft, by default, does not use any data whatsoever to retrain our uh, the Azure OpenAI models at all. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. And one last one before we close off. Sorry, I know we're three minutes over. And this one for either of you, probably for you, Tim, if you want to start, please. Like, I know we went through the whole presentation and we kind of explained how um, uh, Cludin and OpenAI are a great combination for making sure that you know, you know your data is as enriched as clean as ready as possible but can we have a concise answer into explaining shortly what's the power of the combination between cluding and open ai like what would be your short kind of value to go 
statement or answer to a question like that. Paolo mentioned this key word before, context. That is the key. <laughs> so I'll give you a good example. If I wrote a prompt called, who is the CEO of, uh, I don't know, uh, company X, right? How much context am I actually providing that? Well, just that sentence, right? But um, in our example before, notice how when we were running this prompt against a record, we had extra metadata in there. We had ages, first names, last names. Uh, we had locations, insurance providers, and all of this. If you can have that also added to the prompt in context, it helps you pinpoint these answers. So for me, OpenAI brings its ama <laughs> amazing natural large language models. And what Cludin brings to the situation is context. And this is very similar to what you're seeing in the Office 365 copilot, the Microsoft 365 part. When you are asking it something, it says, I've got the whole Microsoft graph behind me that can say, oh, I know this is Tim asking this. I know Tim is this position. He's written these other documents. He's, and that all adds context and nuance the answer. I'd say that's the most powerful thing between the two parties. Brilliant. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you for your expertise, for the time you spent with us this morning. For all our attendees, I really hope that you got real insights and value from our session today. Please uh, get in touch in case you want something tailored, something to go through, and maybe we can have a private session where we can go through a lot more details uh, uh, about Cludin and how you can leverage our, our technology. I know we're a little bit over time. We will share with you the recording of this session. Again, any question comes afterwards, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. And thank you so much all for attending. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you. Thank all. You Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Paolo. Talk to you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.